But I, I pray that this message is a blessing to us as we kind of look at now today a little bit more clearly, what is this mist and darkness idea? And now we've been looking at, and I've talked about four things in the last two Sundays specifically. And number one, we've talked about how as a people of God and as people who follow Jesus Christ and live for them, we need to be a people of prayer. In fact, one of our uh, mission, or sorry, our values that I'll start to kind of, you'll start to see um, posted around the church and posted in our bulletin, and I'll talk to us, I'll talk to you guys about it. I, I want you guys to have some time to weigh in on our vision and mission stuff, if you care to, um, but um, it's, it's going to be this idea of we value prayer, and I have a little slogan for that is, is living in prayer. Right? And uh, it, it's something that as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to live in. And we talked about if we are not living in prayer, we're going to be living in mist and darkness. And the second thing we talked about is this idea that we need to be pe- dependent on Jesus Christ leading through the presence and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And that if we are not open to the Holy Spirit, if we are not listening to the Holy Spirit as we are following Christ, as we recognize the Holy Spirit leads us, but leads us only in the direction of Christ, right? The Holy Spirit, when Jesus said, I'll send the Comforter, I'll send the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ said, and we've looked at this before, he said, though, he said that he will tell you the words that I give him. So that means the Spirit of God directs our mind towards Christ. The Spirit of God gives us the words that Jesus Christ gives him, okay? And if we are not engaged in following Jesus Christ, in, in, in keeping in step with the Spirit, or as we, we allow the Spirit of God to kind of be working in us by, by prayer and by, by the Word and by, and by God's people, you know, we're going to be living in mist and darkness. We can say we're following Jesus, but if we're not keeping in step with the Spirit, as our eyes are focused on Christ, we're going to be, we're going to get off. We're going to be living in mist and darkness. The third thing I said that we need to be to reject the cultural kind of understanding and influence of self-sufficiency. Are we highly value self-sufficiency in our lives? And perhaps for for the kind of that that regular day, there is there is uh, you know our our regular week, our our working and our jobs and stuff like that. There is this aspect that we honor God by being self-sufficient. But yet in our walk with Jesus Christ, we need to recognize that we cannot be self-sufficient and be followers of Jesus Christ as we're called to in the Word of God. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are profoundly dependent on Jesus Christ. And so we have to guard against letting that cultural influence of, you know, of that strong value of self-sufficiency influence our walk with Jesus Christ. We need each other. We need the Father, we need the Son, we need the Jesus Christ, we need the, sorry, the Holy Spirit in our lives, and we need to be dependent on each other as we live life. We need each other. We don't have to do it alone, and it's not good for us to be alone. And, then for, and, and, and if we are living kind of in our self-sufficiency, especially in our Christian walk, and that's influencing guys we're living in mist and darkness. And then number four, we need to also reject our cultural influence and that value of individualism, right? That, that, that it's not just about me and Jesus. That's not all he calls me to. Yes, it is about me and Jesus, and I need a personal walk with him. But there is more that goes on. And if we're, not, if we're living kind of in that, that individualistic mindset and bringing that into our relationship with Jesus Christ, we're living in mist and darkness. And so I've talked about mist and darkness a lot, but I haven't actually kind of unfolded what that means or how we get there, right? I haven't made it really clear then what is this mist and darkness thing. And this morning we are going to look at that. So let's jump into Acts 13, 4 to 12. Now we've read this passage several times in the last couple of weeks, so I'm just going to jump through it quickly. But I want it fresh on our mind again. And it says in verse 4, and now we know that we're talking about Barnabas and Saul, soon to be Barnabas and Paul, and we'll see the name change actually in this passage. Let's jump into verse 4. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Cilicia, and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at uh, Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues, 
John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bargesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimaeus, El, or Elumas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, there's the name change, filled, the, filled with the Holy Spirit, again, note that, looked straight at Elimaeus and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and, trick and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Let's, fir let's first, uh, as we jump into this, let's first take a quick look at the map, and we'll do this a little bit as we continue through Acts. Can, we, can you drop it to the, to the map there, Joel, for a second? And I just, I don't want to spend much time on this, but uh, so he starts off here, okay, um, at uh, close to Antioch and uh, Seleucia, right? And then he sails down to uh, Cyprus, which is the island that's just right by in the Med Mediterranean there. And so he, he goes to the first city and then he goes through. It is assumed that he's actually, there's two kind of major cities that are listed, but um, it's, it's, it's assumed that they actually preached kind of through the island is what Luke is trying to say. So that's often kind of the thought. Uh, so they go to the synagogues throughout the, wherever there's, you know, Jewish people that are meeting. And then they go to uh, Paphos. And that's where we are right now in the story. Guys, I would encourage you, if you have Google Maps on your computer, uh, this is something I do in a class, is I actually go through this journey on Google Maps. And you can get, uh, you can kind of see what it is like today, which is actually a little bit eye-opening. Also on Google Maps, you can see a bunch of pictures. They even have archaeological sites where they have done digging, where they kind of see, you can see some of the, 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 the ancient uh, kind of ruins and stuff like that. So uh, you can use Google Maps for that. I, I enjoy doing that. Um, I don't have time for that this morning. It would take up the whole time. So, uh, but I would encourage you to do that if you're kind of wondering, if you're wondering um, kind of what does the... What does it look like a little bit more clearly so you can have a better understanding of that? It's a, good, it's a good idea. Jumping back to the text there, in Paphos, we read that uh, they meet a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Uh, his name is also um, uh, El Yumas. In the, the U is actually uh, Yuh, so El Yumas uh, in the uh, Semitic language. Uh, and that, that, that name specifically means sorcerer. Uh, it is believed by most that he probably gave himself that name. It means like sorcerer or even wise man. Wise man, okay? Uh, so he probably appointed himself that name. And that's what he was trying to do. But Paul is very clear. He is a sorcerer and a false prophet. And uh, the false prophet was uh, an, an attendant to Sergius Paulus. Now, we have to pay attention because I think oftentimes when we think of a very powerful person like Sergius Paulus, and then we, we connect that with attendance, we often probably think of like a king and his servants. Uh, we think of like Pharaoh and his wise men. We think of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, okay? Uh, the one thing to note about this, and I think it's important for us to note to understand who Bar-Jesus is, is that the, even though NIV uses the idea of attendant, uh, which is true, he did attend to him, we have to make sure that we don't think servant, okay? Um, if you want to translate this, uh, this Greek word kind of straight over, it's, it was like he was with him. He was with him. So his attendant, his serving, wasn't as a servant, but actually is more like Bar-Jesus, the sorcerer, just attached himself to this powerful Roman uh, leader, Okay? So, so, so uh, Bar-Jesus isn't there because he's a slave or he's, you know, um, 
he has to be. Okay, there isn't, there isn't that. There, there's words to explain that. Uh, Luke doesn't use that here. He does attend him. He helps him. It's understood that likely uh, Sergius Paulus used Bar Jesus' knowledge of the Old Testament and some of those things. Remember, he was a Jewish man. He was a, a Jewish wise man. He was a Jewish false prophet. So it's likely um, Sergius Paulus used his knowledge to help rule the Jews in his kingdom, so to speak, in his, under his authority. And we recognize that, that even though he's a Roman, he had lots of Jews, right? Because when we remember the map, which is not there anymore, don't worry about it. They went throughout the island of Paphos preaching where? At the synagogues. So there were definitely Jews that he was leading. And that's important to, to understand that because if Bar-Jesus wasn't a servant, but yet attended, right, and gave counsel to him, why, how did they, they, they had this relationship that obviously was both of them were gaining something from this. It is likely believed, and it, or it is likely and it's believed that uh, Bar-Jesus had attached himself to the pro council because he wanted to gain for himself power and glory and Bar Jesus was uh, freely there on his, for his own purposes. Uh, MacArthur writes, It is no accident that this man had attached himself to the Roman proconsul. The kingdom of darkness is, is eager to influence those who rule. Much of the evil in this world can be traced ultimately to such menacing influence by the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Not only did Bar Jesus desire to influence the proconsul, towards evil, but also towards his own purposes. And we see that as this story develops. Bar-Jesus Bar influences the Roman leader, and yet we also see very clearly that he is an enemy of God's truth. In Luke, uh, sorry, in Acts um, 13, 7 to 8, it says, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to, what did he want to do? He wanted to hear about the word of God. Clearly, so recognize how smart, recognize the, the clarity of this. Clearly, he was a wise man because even though Bar-Jesus was a false prophet, a Jewish false prophet, he understood that, the, I mean, Sergius Paulus, had an inkling that whatever, yes, uh, Bar Jesus was teaching truth. He was he knew the Old Testament to some degree. He knew God's word, but yet Sergius Paulus invites Paul and Barnabas what to hear God's word. So there's an understanding there that it is likely or logical that he understood. Yes, he knows stuff. Yes, he allowed him into his presence to help him rule. He obviously used him in some sense for his counsel, but he didn't obviously trust him all that much because he asked Paul and Barnabas to come and share the word of God. But when he does share the word of God, Bar-Jesus, it says that El El Elumas the sorcerer opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Bar Jesus, I'm just going to use Bar Jesus, it's easier to now pronounce, okay? Did not want Sergius Paulus to hear or to accept the truth about Jesus Christ. In verse 10, Paul sees him for who he really is. You are a child of the devil, he says in verse 10. He says, an enemy that of everything that is right. He says, full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. And he says, will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? In Paul's rebuke, we see why Luke had claimed uh, a couple times. He's almost redundant in clarifying he was a sorcerer and a false prophet. It is likely that Bar-Jesus has passed himself off as some type of Jewish wise man, a holy man, even a Jewish prophet. He passed himself off as someone who knows the truth and knew God's truth. But it is likely that he did this to influence and to gain for himself a standing of power and a standing of influence. Yet Paul sees right through him. And Paul calls him out. Recognize that Paul sees what he's actually doing. He sees through 
what, even though he's a prophet, even though he's a sorcerer, even though he's a wise man, Paul sees through his actions. And Paul notes that he is a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that is right. Paul notes that he was full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Bar Jesus is charged for perverting the right ways of God. So let's just look at that. He's twisting truth and he perverts the ways of God. Listen now for his own purposes and glory, right? That's what's going on here. Paul sees it. Bar Jesus is charged for perverting the right ways of God. He's twisting truth and perverting God's ways for his own purposes and glory. When he hears Paul's preaching the truth, he fights back, right? When, when Bar Jesus hears Paul preaching, he fights back. Why does he fight back? He fights back because he knows he's about to lose his influence, his position, and his power. He's going to lose all the things that he is working so hard and has worked so hard to get. Right? He knows that God's truth is challenging his life and is reve going to reveal that he is living to fulfill and satisfy his own desires and to get what he wants. And the truth is now his enemy, as Paul shares, as Paul shares. Paul calls him a child of the devil. What is interesting about this is that Jesus used a similar phrase when speaking to the Pharisees in the Gospels. In John 8, 43 to 44, Jesus says this, Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. He's talking to the Pharisees. You belong to your father, the devil. Okay? Children of the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus outs the Pharisees for being liars and really unable to hear truth. He calls them children of the devil. And Jesus, a couple verses later, really brings out the light of, the, of, of what is the purposes behind that action of the Pharisees. Why they're not willing to listen. Why they're twisting truth. Why they're actually children of the devil. And he brings it out and he says in verse 49 of John 8, he says, I am not possessed by a demon. They charged him of that. Jesus said... But I honor my father and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it and he is the judge. And he's speaking about God the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my words will never see death. Why does Jesus bring up this idea of, I am not seeking glory for myself? If you actually look at the context of the verse, that was never a part of the conversation. But Jesus brings that up because he sees into the heart of the Pharisees. They're twisting truth and they're, they're engaged in getting what they want. And one of the things that they want is to see glory for themselves. Jesus is getting to the heart of the issue. And he says for himself, I do not seek glory for myself. Jesus says, I am not doing this for me. Right? That's what he's saying. He's like, I'm not doing this ministry. I'm not doing this preaching. I'm not doing this healing just for me so that I get what I want. Remember that, that's, and that's why he calls them a child of, of the devil. Remember, Satan wanted to be like God. He rejected his position God had gave him or made him for. And he had said, and now this is in my own words, but pay attention. And when Jesus says, I want, or when Satan says, I want to be like God, and he kind of rejects the position that God made for him, recognize what he's saying. And I'm going to say it in my rooms. He's basically saying, if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to live this life, if I'm going to be who you made me to be, I'm going to do it for me, right? And Lucifer, of course, was, was made as the, as what, from what we understand, is made as the kind of the chief instructor of worship in God's presence. He was beautiful. But Satan goes, no, 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 if I'm going to do this, it's going to be for me. Recognize what he's saying. It's not going to be for your glory, it's going to be for my glory if I'm doing this, right? And Jesus points to that in the Pharisees, and he says, 
I don't, Jesus says, I don't do this for my glory. Think about Jesus' life and all that he was doing. He's basically, I'm not living this life for my glory. I'm not doing all this that I'm called to do for my glory. I'm doing it for the one who deserves the glory, the Father, God the Father. I'm doing it for his glory. And the Pharisees are called children of the devil because it, in part, deep down, they were saying like Satan did, if I'm doing this, it's going to be for me. It's going to be for my glory. It's going to be for what I want and the, the, the ways I, 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 I want to be. It's, 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 if I'm doing this, it's going to be for me. Bar Jesus was this type of man, a child of the devil. He was a child of the devil who claimed to know the truth, yet he twisted it and was full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. He perverted the right ways of the Lord so that he could be someone and have power and have glory. He lived not for God's purposes and glory alone, but rather chiefly focused on his life, twisting truth for his own heart's desire. And as Paul rebukes him, note what happens in verse 11. Now the hand of the Lord is against you, Paul said. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. It is ironic, but the judgment that Paul calls on Bar-Jesus matches his crime. Pay attention to that. What he calls on Bar-Jesus actually clarifies and reveals where he is spiritually. By twisting the scriptures and perverting the good ways of God, Bar-Jesus was, in fact, already living spiritually in mist and darkness. He thought he saw. He thought he knew what he was doing. He thought he was, he was a wise man. He was a wise man. He was kind of above the rest. He was giving wisdom to the ruler in that area, right? Yet truly, spiritually, he was living in mist and darkness. It would seem his punishment not only fit the crime, but it also revealed Bar-Jesus' true ways. His physical eyes were being blinded to match the mist and darkness in his spiritual eyes and life. Guys, living in mist and darkness is about living for yourself, for your own purposes, for your own desires, and for your own glory, well knowing but twisting God's truth in order to justify it and order and in order to accomplish it, right? I'm going to say that again. Guys, living in mist and darkness is about living for yourself, for your own purposes, desire, desires and for your own glory, well knowing the truth of God, but yet twisting it to justify and to accomplish your own purposes. It is what the Pharisees did. It is what we see Bar-Jesus here doing. And for it, he is judged and is physically blinded. Applicationally speaking, I want to focus on two core truths as we've kind of looked at this passage. Number one is this. God is bigger than the evil in man, and God is bigger than the evil in this world. Paul and Barnabas are in real and evident spiritual battle here for the soul of Sergius Paulus. Bar-Jesus intentionally trying to turn Sergius Paulus away from the faith. They are in battle for the heart and soul of this man, of this ruler, and, and possibly even, as we recognize, as he is a ruler, he's going, to be he's going to be affecting others. He's going to be, as a follower of Jesus Christ, he's going to be influencing others towards Christ. So it's maybe not just, I mean, in this moment, it's just his soul. But we don't know what God did with this man and how God was going to use this man for his glory. So they are in a spiritual battle for the heart and soul of this man and maybe even others as he lives out Christ and as he shines Jesus to those that he influences. And what does Paul do? Paul recognizes the battle and recognize how big and how strong our God is. Right? What does Paul do? He basically just addresses the truth, which is so incredible. Right? Paul recognizes the battle. 
He looks right at Bar Jesus. He recognizes and, and faces the enemy. We get like glimpses of, and this is where we could go into Ephesians 6, right? Where we, uh, after we have done all to stand, we stand there, the, we stand then therefore taking on, and we talk about the spiritual uh, armor of God, right? But that idea that after we have done everything to prepare ourselves to stand, then we stand up. We face the enemy, right? I think oftentimes in our day and age, we don't even recognize when the enemy is fighting us. And I've shared with this before, right? We don't recognize what is a spiritual battle. And when, when, when there are spiritual influences that are trying to, really, if we, if we pay attention, it, that are trying to destroy us. For Satan looks and he, he, he prowls around seeking for those he may destroy. It's not a game. Satan understands what's at stake. Demons understand what are at, are at stake. He knows that if he can rip apart a marriage, of, 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 of that, that he can probably influence the children towards the direction of hell. He knows that if he can rip apart families, he can influence people in the area towards, if he can rip apart a church, if he can pay attention, Satan gets what's at, at stake. And he is in a battle, right? And so often we miss looking at the spiritual battle at hand. Our battle is not, Ephesians 6, against flesh and blood, right? It's against the principalities and forces of darkness that rule this world. That's where our battle lies. But so often we find ourselves fighting who? Fighting each other, right? Husbands fighting wives, wives fighting husbands, parents fighting kids, kids fighting parents, in-laws fighting, church fighting, friends fighting, right? Remember, Satan is on the prowl, looking for who he may devour. And when we have sin in our, in our lives, I believe so very much that that sin allows him entrance to gain influence into our lives. So we need to be on guard. Paul looks directly at Bar-Jesus, and he resists him. He speaks truth. He is filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and rebukes Bar Jesus, and he clarifies or he, 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 he outs his evil. Guys, this is how we also must face evil and the spiritual forces of darkness in our lives. First, recognize when you are being attacked by evil and then face it, and in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ, rebuke it. James 4 7 reads, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. God is, Paul is submitted to God and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we are submitted to God and focused on Jesus Christ, walking with, uh, sorry, in his will and way, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, strongholds crumble. Our God is the all-powerful authority, that, sorry, on earth. And everything on earth, everything on earth has been given to him. His name alone is how we win spiritual battles. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 57. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 reads this. But thanks to be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to note something in that passage, okay? It's a very, very important part of the passage. There's really two things. The one you probably picked up on, Jesus Christ. The second one is this. Thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ is ours, not that I have ownership of him, but you see what I mean. When I am his and he is mine, he is my Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, we have victory over evil and can have victory over evil when he is ours. And I know and I pray that all of us can say, Jesus is mine. He is ours. First John 4, 4, the little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And he's talking about evil men, evil times. John 1, 5 says, the light shines in the darkness and the dark darkness has not overcome it. 
right? We are not just put out on our own into the battlefield and be like, oh, I hope, it, I hope, I hope you do okay. We have the light of Jesus Christ in us, and evil and darkness cannot overcome it, and it has not overcome it. Guys, note that we might be little children when it comes to our faith. We might be little children as we follow Jesus Christ, but let us remember that Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and the Father, the God that we serve, is not a little child. He is an all-powerful king and creator and authority in this world. Our first truth to remember as we deal with evil people and as we deal in evil times is to remember that our God is an all-powerful God and He is greater than evil. And the one who lives in us, Jesus Christ, has overcome the world and we have the victory in His power and name. We have victory in His power and name. I pray you remember that and that as we remember that and recall it more and more that we actually live from victory to victory. That we live from victory to victory in our lives. We're not going to be perfect. I get that. But when it comes to our daily relationships, husbands, wives, kids, brothers, sisters, family, co-workers, boss, teachers, coaches, friends, that we are constantly remembering Jesus Christ is the victory. If there is evil present, it has not overcome the light that is within me. In Jesus Christ is my power, right? Let's not fall into the patterns of this world where we're blaming others, running from sin, covering up, those kind of things. Let's turn to the evil. Let's face it. Let's rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's, free, let's flee from it, right? And run towards Jesus. Our second... Uh, second application is more of a warning. And no, I, I, I'm <coughs> likely none of us would be considered sorcerers. Any sorcerers present that you're not telling us about? Secret sorcerers in the group? None of us are sorcerers, and I believe probably none of us intentionally recognize or intentionally jump into twisting the truth to fulfill our own promises, our own purposes, sorry to get our own ways. None of us probably intentionally do that, right? But there still is an application for us in this passage as we see what takes place with Bar-Jesus and with Paul, and that is this idea of us subtly twisting truth, maybe even not realizing it. Now, guys, we do that a lot. And I'm going to say we. That's me, too. I'm not saying just you. I'm saying we do this a lot. And this week, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, in the thoughts from the pastor, I'm going to talk a little bit about and explain a little bit about how our personalities can influence what we accept in Scripture and then what we kind of ignore in Scripture. Even just our personalities are prone to do that. Just like our personalities sometimes clash with other people, right? And when we recognize that our personalities kind of clash with other people, we often do what? Intentionally get closer to those people, right? No. Because our personalities, we, you know, oftentimes we're trying to be polite. We're good Christian people, and we're like, our personalities don't, you know. But what do we do with those people that our personalities kind of clash with? The opposite thing that we do with the people that have personalities that we get really along, you know, kindred spirits. I think of Anna Green Gables and... Sarah, is it Sarah? I don't remember right now, but the dark-haired one. What do you do with someone that your personality clicks with, that you're like kindred spirits? What do you do with that person? You intentionally spend more time with them. The people that your personality kind of clashes with, you often intentionally spend less time with them. And guys, when it comes to our personalities, we can do the same thing with the Word of God. The things that we like, we, we like those passages. We like that scripture. We kind of lean towards those. We like those. The things that we don't like, we kind of move away from, right? We, we distance ourselves from some of those things. I'll give you an example, okay? What do you do on a regular basis? Think about this. What do you do on a regular basis that the Bible tells you to do that you hate? But week after week, day after day, you're like, God, I don't like this. 
but I love you and I want to obey your word. So I will do that. And I will be careful to make sure that I do it every opportunity I can. What is that for you? You know, guys, oftentimes it's hard for us to think about it. You know why? Because even though we know, and I, maybe, maybe you can say to yourself, nope, I do everything that the, the, the Bible tells me to do. I do it all. And I do it consistently. So I, I don't have any of those. But I know I don't. I know that there are things that I do quite consistently because it, when I read the Word of God, I'm like, hey, I like that. I, and and I'm, I might be good at that. And that fits my personality. So I'm going to do that. I like that. I'm going to... I'm going to save those scriptures. But I also know the word of God calls me to do things that I don't like. And I'm pretty sure there's some things in here that it calls you to do consistently that you might not like. It's not in my personality. I'm not, I'm not like an outgoing guy. I don't like just talking to, to, to new people on the street. I don't just like going to someone's house and serving and being like, hey, how can I help? I don't like... I don't like um, I don't like speaking up front. I don't like talking to people about Jesus. I don't like, there's a thousand things probably, maybe not a thousand things, but there are probably definitely some things that you know are in here that you don't do on a regular basis, even though we're called to. It's, we're, it's, supposed, it's supposed to be a part of our lives. And, if, and, 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 and the, the, the thing is that we should have that answer. Well, this is the thing, this is the thing, this is the thing. These are the four things I hate doing, but I do them all the time. Why? Because I love Jesus. We should have those. <clears throat> you know why? And we should remember that. You know why that should be so quick in our mind? Because it's something that we're struggling with weekly, but we've made it a, an intention in our lives. Because I love Jesus, I'm going to do it. But what do we do? Guys, a little bit like bar Jesus. A little bit like the Pharisees. We end up twisting scripture. And I think, I think, to be really honest, guys, I don't know if we, I don't think most of us do this intentionally. We're not doing it with evil intention. But we do it, and it happens subtly in our lives. Where we lean towards the things that we like and that we're okay with. And we push away from the things that we don't really like. Right? Guys, recognize what happens over time as we live that way. We start to understand the scriptures. We know the truth, but we actually kind of change it. We twist it a little bit by not, by kind of subtling, subtly, subtly ignoring some of the things that we know we should probably be doing. Recognize that we're doing. There is a warning for us this, in this. Because as Bar Jesus was doing it intentionally, he knew the truth, he was twisting it, and he was walking in mist and darkness. I think that we can, if we're not careful, we can also begin to walk in mist and darkness if we are not careful to accept the full truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we end up leaning to some things and kind of ignoring other things, guys, we can be in danger of living in mist and darkness, thinking we're okay, thinking we're all good, but the truth is there's a little bit of blindness. I would encourage you, as when he, you know, I, was in, I would encourage you to search your heart. Maybe this week, think about what are those things I know it's in here, but I don't do. Lord God, give me wisdom to, and give me courage to start doing them, even if they're not kind of fit my personality, Right? Let us be living in prayer, dependent on the Holy Spirit's leading, free from our cultural understanding of independence and self-sufficiency, accepting the full counsel of the gospel, not twisting truth for our own glory, our own purposes, and our own ways, so that we keep from being blinded, so that we keep from living in mist and darkness, but rather walk in the light of His presence, seeing clearly His will and way, for our lives. Let us live in his truth and accept all of it. And let us live for her, his purposes and let us live for his glory alone. For his glory alone. Because God's children live for God's glory alone.
Let's pray.